Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 47 of the Real Talk podcast. Today, obviously, our massive, massive crossover episode with the Raiders of the Lost podcast. Boys, we've been foreshadowing this for at least a month now on our social media, and the day's finally here. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be going through our top 10 movies of 2023. So we got the two Raiders boys, all four of us. We're all going to go through our top 10 movies of 2023, as well as given all of our least favorite movies of 2023 as well at the end. So it's going to be talking about all the movies that have come out so far this year. It's going to be a great episode recapping the year where we're at so far as we are a little over the halfway point, but for all intents and purposes about at the halfway point of the year. And of course, the, none of these movies would have came out and no movie that will still come out would have came out without the writers and the actors behind it. I just want to say that WGA and SAG links to help them support them in any way possible to educate yourself are all in the description of all of our YouTube videos now. And um, yeah, none of these movies would have been able to have been made without them. We really support the writers and, and actors. We really hate the studios. And lastly, before we get into the episode of the crossover, I just want to say if you're new here, give us a follow, subscribe on YouTube, follow us on Spotify and Apple, rate us five stars. It really helps out. I know if you're a real talk listener that's never listened to Raiders, we're going to be pushing you all over there right now to go rate their podcast five stars, subscribe to them on YouTube. So if you're kind of doing the same thing on, on their end and you're from the Raiders pod and you haven't listened to us before, give us a subscribe, follow, give us a like. We're happy to have you here and we hope you enjoy this crossover episode with the Raiders boys. So without further ado, let's get into it. Podcast listeners, are you ready for the crossover of the century for the film community with Raiders of the Lost podcast? And real talk. What's up, fellas? We got all the boys in the house today. Hey, boys. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. We've been hyping this Very up for a exciting. long time. I'm glad the day's finally here. It's, yeah. It took a while, yeah, but we've all, we're all fans of each other. We're all pals now, and it's great to meet other people who love film as much as us and love talking about it. And congrats to you guys for building your own community and podcast as well. You guys are killing it right now. And wherever you're listening, this is uh, posting on both platforms for Raiders of the Lost podcast and the Real Talk podcast on all platforms. Definitely check out both shows for both of us. We want to share our audiences and spread the word of our channels. So you got me, James, Anthony. We got Cam. We got Tyler. We got George. We got Seth. Everybody's in the house. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to do our top 10 rankings of 2023 so far, about a midway point here in July, August now. So very excited. And this is assuming nothing gets nothing gets pushed back for the remainder of the year. Yeah. So yeah, I swear to God, if Dune Two gets pushed, end. if it gets pushed back, my God, it this might be the end. It would be the studio's I'll fault. Though. Freak out! All right, do you guys yeah, want to so, say anything to our audience before we begin? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Follow me on TikTok. Seth's film reviews <laughs> <laughs> on TikTok. <laughs> no, yeah. So like, in, man. Man. <laughs> real talk podcast have been going on for almost a year at this point now, and definitely the Raiders of the Lost Podcast are, are the biggest kind of light in the horizon that we look to as a guiding light of how you guys are doing stuff. You guys accomplish stuff the right way all the time. So definitely been really inspiring to watch you and follow you along your journey. And it's been very helpful for us as we've started our podcasting journey. And as we've started to develop our style over the years. So we've really loved what you guys do. Obviously we're always bantering back and forth on social media. So definitely uh, very excited to finally do the official crossover, but anyone who's listening, it's a Raiders fan. Definitely feel free to come check us out. And if you're listening and you're, you're a real talk fan, you've never watched the Raiders before and you're on the real talk page right now, definitely go over to their Spotify, rate them five stars, go to their YouTube, subscribe to them, Twitter, all that good stuff. Just uh, let's help support both these movie podcasts as we grow this community even greater. Exactly. Yeah. We're, we're very easy to find. Just search Raiders of the Lost <laughs> podcast anywhere. You will yeah. find us. And you guys, we don't like to pick favorites, but you're our favorite other podcast. We love you guys. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, from, from, from a more personal standpoint, yeah, like Tyler said, you guys have been a huge inspiration for us. You guys were the first podcast I ever was on. Super welcoming dudes, super awesome guys. You guys have been massive supporters of mine and obviously Tyler, Seth, and Cam's for a while, so... Really happy I don't listen to any other music podcast except you. So yeah, that's, oh, that's literally. So, so I'm I'm super happy we we got we found the time to to hop on together and do this little little crossover episode. So basically, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go one by one. Basically, we're gonna start from ten to six with everyone's bottom of their top ten rankings one at a time. We're gonna go in alphabetical order. So it's gonna go Anthony, Ham, George, James, me, Seth, and Tyler, and then we'll go individually from five to one rankings talking about each number one so how about anthony you kick us off with your 10 to 6 of 2023 so far yeah it's been an interesting year so far and i think that the second half might end up being stronger than the first half 
um, because the spring was kind of weak. Um, But there have been some veteran directors and some newish directors that have been coming out with films. And then we get Chris Nolan, obviously. Um, But my number 10 pick is John Wick 4. I, I love the film. It ended up being, I think, a little too long for me, but the action, the stunts were, were there, and it was a lot of fun. Um, but for me, my favorite John Wick movie is the first one. Mm-hmm. And then I got at number nine, The Flash. I actually enjoyed this film. I thought it was fun. I thought it was entertaining. Um, I thought it was interesting. Uh, the CGI, except for some of the face sequences, looked like really good to me. Um, I think it gets a little too much hate, in my opinion. And then Barbie, which we just saw yesterday, I walked into it not knowing what to expect, and halfway through the film, I was like, okay, I really like this, and I ended up loving it by the end, and I gave it even a four-star rating on Letterboxd. It was a lot more um, intelligent, nuanced, entertaining, and had a lot more to say than I was thinking it was going into it, so Greta Gerwig did a fantastic job with that. At number seven, I have Asteroid City. Wes Anderson, I think, is this is his return to form. It was really fantastic, dynamic cast, incredible production, like always. And I found like it felt like it was like an older Wes Anderson movie. And then at number six, I have Across the Spider-Verse, which I thought was really fantastic, groundbreaking animation, a lot of fun, very emotional, and all around an entertaining film. I think I saw everyone smile when you said John Wick at number 10. <laughs> I, I, was, I was smiling because I'm looking at George's face when you say that. That's what that, 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 that I, I swear Anthony hates me. John Wick at 10 and then across the Spider-Verse, <laughs> not in the top five. I told you. I told you. I told you. I know. <laughs> Anthony, I just curious, like, how many of you watched so far this year? So, like, what's your – well, oh, yeah, everyone should say, like, at the top yeah, of theirs, yeah. like, how many How many have you seen so far in 2023? These are top 10 out for, of how new, many? For new re- – for new releases or just in total? New releases, yeah, just, 2023. Just new release. I get a... Hold on one sec. He's seen a, he's seen a lot. <laughs> I can pull it up right now. I got my letter boxed up. All right, so I've seen 28 new releases so far in 2023. Okay. Wow, okay. interesting. Okay. All right. All right. We have someone who's down at my level. That's great. I thought <laughs> yeah, I'd be boy. Way, way. I, I've, I actually finally logged all the films I've ever seen. I'm over 4,000. Jesus Christ. That's too many. Yeah. Oh, I that's do you hear, that's do you hear the way that's he old. said that? Don't, don't worry. I've logged yeah. all the films. I'm over 4,000, everybody. So yeah, jealous. Yeah, like, yeah, big dick do, Anthony do, over here. <laughs> I don't know if we applaud you or feel bad for you. No, no, we applaud that. We applaud that. Uh, I have a movie podcast, so I think I know what I'm talking about now. If anyone wants to question me. I've seen some movies. <laughs> yeah, 28 so far in 2023. Yeah. All right. I- interesting bottom six, uh, bottom five. Anthony. We love it. We respect it. Yeah. Everyone mm-hmm. respects I can it. debate Spider-Verse <laughs> if you guys want to. All right, Cam, you're up next. What's your 10 to 6 of 2023 Alrighty. so far? Um, I've seen uh, – yeah, so I've seen 41 this year. Uh, for those watching on YouTube, you just saw me have a little strongman competition with a bo- uh, twist-off paint bottle. Um, but <laughs> – so I yeah, like I said, I've seen 41, definitely some that I want to see still, but I, I'm pretty happy with my list so far and I'm I, I can stand by it. Um so in number 10, I have Elemental. Uh I really adored this movie. I think it was a fun time. Um it, it's not for everyone, it definitely is surface level at moments, but I, I did really enjoy it. Um at number nine, I have Barbie. I think that's where you were at, Anthony, at number nine. Um yeah. so uh a little overlap there. Barbie. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thought it was hilarious. Probably the funniest movie of the year, and had a lot of a lot of deeper meaning to it than um, I originally thought it would. But I was really really proud of, or really glad I went and saw that one. Um, and then at number eight, Air, uh, four out of five as well, and eighty two out of hundred. I guess Anthony and James, if you don't know, I rate every movie out of a hundred, so um, I will say that as well. So Air, really really enjoyed that. Watched it a little late, uh, and then jumping into the four and a half out of five at number seven, Suzume uh 86 out of 100 something like that um probably the best intro of the year everyone gives it to evil dead riser best title card uh suzume is so much better i think um and then at yeah thank you george and then at number six john wick chapter four which uh for the yeah for the um <laughs> real talk fellas people have other opinions were, george <laughs> yeah yeah but the they're wrong fellas, um <laughs> This movie did start at a five star for me and then went down on rewatch. And then like, as I think of like how it stacks up with movies this year, it's gone down even more. So um, I, I do enjoy it, but I do think I enjoy uh, John Wick number one um, the most, but I have an 88 out of a hundred, uh, four and a half out of five. Couldn't agree more, man. Yeah. I love, I love the good five. Movie. 
Excellent. Are you going to ever add decibels to your rating system at some point? <laughs> no, no. I'm down with bi down with big decibel. That's why I do out of a hundred. I, I hate Tyler's rating system. Down with big decibel. <laughs> Terrible. It's awful. All right, George. It's finally your time to shine. We we all assume John Wick Four is yeah. not your bottom five. That good, good, good assumption. Good assumption. Uh, yeah, I, I rearranged my top ten a little bit last night. Um, I don't know. Just some movies resonate with me more the the longer removed I am from the time I watched them. But I, I think I'm pretty happy with my top ten right now. At number ten, I have Air. Really, really solid uh, little, little biopic. I think we're oversaturated right now with these like businessy movies, but this is definitely one of the ones that stands uh, above the rest for me. My number nine goes to uh, Scream 6. Uh, really loving what they're doing with this, uh, you know, Scream 5 and 6, the soft reboot, uh, you know, sequel type movies. Uh, just have a really good time with these movies. Uh, we'll go back to back horror because my number eight is Evil Dead Rise. Um, absolutely loved Evil Dead Rise. I think it's a really uh, fun combination of the quirkiness of the original Raimi trilogy um, mixed with, you know, the more brutal 2013 Evil Dead that we got. Um, and I just had a really good time. Alyssa Sutherland is still my pick for Best Supporting Actress at this current moment. I think she was brilliant uh, in this movie. Um, my number seven goes to Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. Um, I think I did myself a disservice having seen Fallout for the first time the day before I watched Dead Reckoning Part 1 yeah. because I think my expectations were just crazy high. Nonetheless, it's still absurd what Tom Cruise is doing with these movies, and I just still have such a good time with them. And then my number six, uh, and maybe it's worth saying, my 10 through 7 and my 6 through 1, there's a little bit of a jump. Um, my number six, uh, I have Suzumi. Um, this just feels like Makoto Shinkai's magnum opus. He's just bringing out all of his tricks, all of his masterful uh, filmmaking techniques, and... I agree with Cam, best title card sequence of the year. And I, I just, I loved Suzumi a, a chunk. Do you have it higher than your name, George? Or is it like, no, no, name? no. I still have your name higher than Suzumi. Don't worry. Your name's fantastic. Yeah, your name. I, I have your name in, I just redid my uh, animated ranking actually. And your name is sitting at my number uh, six spot right now. I think it's like three for me, honestly, at this point. I think it's yeah, amazing. It, amazing. That's five out of five for me, your name, no doubt. Yeah, it's, the, it's an notion, emotional movie. All right. Well, thank you so much, George, for sharing your bottom five my, of oh, your top ten. <laughs> my 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 correct ranking for everyone listening. <laughs> There's only one correct ranking. So yeah, I, George. I, didn't, I didn't hear John Wick four on that. Yeah. <laughs> no. Like, not yet. Not uh, yet. He has it. He has it. All of his top three positions are John Wick four. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Impressive. All right. Now it's time for my ten through six. At number ten, I have Creed three. I love boxing movies, and the Rocky franchise is so important to me for my youth growing up and falling in love with film. And I think Michael B. Jordan knocked it out of the park with this directorial debut. I think it's awesome. Number nine, I have The Flash. I don't care what anyone says. I enjoyed the hell out of this film. I had a lot of fun. It's one of my favorite superhero movies I've seen in the last several years. And I don't care about the hate. I loved it. I had a great time. I love that. You do you, bro. I'm going to do me. <laughs> Number eight, I have Barbie. Like Andy said, we saw it yesterday. I found it delightful and hilarious. It lost me a little bit in the middle when we're in the real world, but the opening is very strong. The last 35 minutes is absolutely brilliant. I had a blast. And just the the cultural zeitgeist of what Barbie's doing in terms of bringing in Barbenheimer to bring events back to the cinema, it's so important. Every time I've been in the movie theaters in the last four days, which has been three or four times, it's just a pink wave. So I just love what Barbie and Oppenheimer are doing while showing kids and bringing these adolescents and teens, making them remember and show them that it's fun to go to the movies. It's an experience to have with other people. So I think it's a really important film this year. Number seven, I have Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Really enjoyed this. Sorry, George. I know you're probably a little upset That's about lower that. than mine, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I loved it. I had a great time. Uh, but, it, you know, it's like the 11th Spider-Man movie. That's why I have it so low as well as it didn't feel like a great, second film because they just took one movie and they're splitting up into two versus something like a dune part one where it's it's specifically made as a part one this was kind of just like a a part one on the fly it, it didn't have a, a great for me a fitting resolution for me, yeah. but i still think yeah. it's a great cliffhanger very empire strikes back so i really enjoyed that number six 
I have the man with the dragon breath shotgun, John Wick 4. So excellent. I agree with Cam. Number one is still my favorite John Wick movie. And with me too, man. And John Wick 4 is still an incredible time. I thought it was a little too long. And I also agree with Cam. My second rewatch in theaters, it brought it down a little more for me. It's just the runtime is just excessive, I think, for what it is. The but action I still think it's a great like time. crazy on the first run. And then the second time when you have the action, you're, it's a little... It's a little down. It's like, I agree. It's like we, all right, we, we get a Keanu knows jujitsu. We, we, yeah, yeah. We get a jujitsu exactly. the seventy six guy this hour, yeah. but I still loved it. Six mm-hmm. in the year. All well, right, worth it. So that's my uh, <laughs> ten through six of twenty twenty three so far. Next up, Seth. What do you got? Yeah, so I've actually only seen thirty films this year, so a little bit more than Anthony, I guess. But there's a lot that I've missed, and I do need to watch a lot more. But my ten is Rye Lane which I believe dropped on Hulu for you guys and dropped uh, on Disney Plus here. Just a charming, infectious rom-com that I really, really enjoyed. A good, charming directorial debut I really liked. My nine is Creed 3. Uh, I'm a sucker for a sports film, no matter how formulaic they are, which Creed 3 is. I think it was stacked with great performances. I think I think um, Michael B. Jordan really did knock out the park when it comes to the visuals. And like I said, combat sports i'm in whether whether it's formulaic or not and i do love the creed franchise especially i do actually think it's one of the best films in the creed franchise as well number eight i have dungeon and dragons honor among thieves i imagine i'll be the only person to have this i am a big high fantasy fan it's definitely the funniest film of the year for me i just i love high fantasy and i love the amount of weirdness and infection I, I love going on the ride with the likable characters uh number seven if you guys didn't know this uh, i am a uh, i'm a big m night i'm a big m night defender so I do have Knock at the Cabin at number seven. I think it was visually inspiring. I think it was thrilling. And I think it was M. Night to a T, which I really, really appreciate because I do really like him as a director. Um, and at number six, I have one that I don't think any of you will have seen, and that is Blue Jean. Um, very, very limited release. It's an English film. A powerful indictment of, of politics around that time in 80s England. Um, a film on sexuality and being yourself. Really, really depressing. Really devastating. Really powerful. Is that um, a... Is that is that the movie uh, made by the Levi Levi's Corporation? I don't that know. Was, that was a blue jeans <laughs> joke for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> that went so over my yeah, head. I, got, I, I was like, like what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was a. I think it was a directorial debut by a woman called uh, George or something, British filmmaker. Um, I, I recommend you all watch it though, because it is really, really great and important. But it's one that. It got a very limited release. I don't think many people saw it. I don't even know if it's out in the US. Uh, but that is I'm my down. I think you'll like it. I really, really yeah, do. It I sounds think it's great. Cool. It's I'll really check it. very cool. curious. Um, I think that joke went over everyone's head because so many corporations are making movies right now about their that, random that, products. Yeah, that, 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 <laughs> so we're like, oh, that makes that makes sense that Levi's made a movie. We're gonna get a Levi Origins in England in the nineteen eighties. There will be yeah. a Levi Origins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Seth. Thanks for the ten through six. Tyler. You are up. All right. Playing a little bit of cleanup hitter here, being the last one to go through. So uh, I have seen 140 2023 releases. So we're up there with with the best of them here. And I do just want to say, yeah, I'm built different. You guys got to know. I'm the new release guy. <laughs> You're like the um, combined total of all of us. Just I'm the opposite show. though. I I mostly watch old. Films, Are you an so A? No, I think that's most people. That's mo- no, that's most <laughs> people. That's 99 percent of people, Seth. Um, for me, I, I do want to say before I get in, like I love the Suzume love. It's not my top ten, but I feel like like I, I saw Raiders Boys. You posted a, a, I think a TikTok about how it's one of the most successful movies of the year. But I feel like in America, at least, I'm not seeing a lot of content creators talking about it enough. So I love the love from Suzume. Seth loved the Rye Lane love. I didn't even realize you watched that, but definitely love the. Have you love seen the that as well? That. Yeah, yeah. I mean, come on, oh, I've sure. seen 140. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and, yeah, then, and only 80 movies that come out, <laughs> yeah. but for me, uh, John wick, just, just so everyone knows John wick is at 25 for me. So, um, but getting into my top 10, number 10, I have a thousand and one Tiana Taylor gives one of my favorite lead actress performances of the year. This movie is very similar to moonlight in terms of it follows a mother and a son over three phases of life. So shifts through three, there's three big time jumps throughout the movie. And it's just a very devastating and dramatic and real movie. Number nine, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Nothing really needs to be said here. Just groundbreaking animation with a very fun story. Um, number eight, Are You There, God? It's me, Margaret. I haven't done my rankings on like where all the actors sit so far this year, but I think Rachel McAdams might still be my number one supporting actress even after uh, Oppenheimer came out. So I, I really enjoyed her performance in this. And I just think this movie is one I went in with very low expectations and was pleasantly surprised. 
Seven's a documentary, but I mean, movies in the name still a Michael J. Fox movie. The intro to this documentary plays out like a cinematic experience and the editing of this is so crazy. I don't think documentaries are eligible for editing awards, but if they were, this one would deserve it. Um, just a very great movie, even if you're not like a huge Back to the Future Michael J. Fox fan, but like who isn't? I mean, come on. And then number six, Fair Play, which is going to be coming out on stre- Struck Streaming Service later this year. Uh, it was a Sundance premiere. After Oppenheimer, a lot of people are giving Alden Ehrenreich his flowers. He's a great in this. And then obviously with the Superman casting news uh, buzz, Phoebe Dynavore was also getting a lot of attention. So both of them are so great in this movie. It's honestly kind of like a grown-up Barbie in terms of it's about this couple together and they're both fighting for getting a promotion at work and the the woman ends up getting it instead of the man and it just really sends him down a dark path of feeling inferior in his relationship, kind of just like, you know, Ken becoming just full incel mode. So kind of like an adult version of Barbie, honestly. But th- there's my 10 through 6. I remember reading about that film. I, I want to watch it soon. It's a great concept. Yeah, definitely. There, there was, there, there right, was one... There was no need for John Wick 4 to catch that stray, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you're the minority, George. Yeah, you didn't no. have to say it was 25. <laughs> yeah, there was no need for that. George is crying. He shut his screen off. <laughs> <laughs> Better retire from podcasting all, right. all around. <laughs> That's everyone's 10 through 6. John Wick 4 podcast. Now we're going to go individually from 5 to 1 with everyone's rankings now. So, Anthony, how about you kick us off? What is your number 5 of 2023? I got to get my Boston boy in there because we're from Boston. Our guy, Ben Affleck's heir. Uh, oh. I, I thought this was a sensational biopic. I'm, I am getting a little, I mean, there's a lot of biopics coming out lately, but this is the best of the year so far um, before, I mean, after Oppenheimer. Um, but this was really entertaining. It was hilarious. Christina <laughs> was killing me the entire time in this film as the sports agent. Um, an excellent ensemble, Robert Richardson doing the cinematography behind the camera. Um, just one of the goats of all time of DPs. And Ben Affleck is an extremely talented director. He really only has one uh, movie on his track record that isn't great. The rest of them are just really fantastic. Fantastic. Fantastic dy- films. <laughs> fantastic dynamic films. Uh, Air, you know the story. You know how it ends. But they did a, an amazing job of making it that suspense and those that like questionable sense of, is this meeting going to go well? Um, Matt Damon just carrying it on his shoulders. Viola Davis, excellent supporting actress in this role. But I just found this to just be like a feel-good kind of film that I grew up watching, and we don't really get those like that too often nowadays. Um, and it's just a bunch of people talking in rooms, and they, it was still endlessly entertaining. So I adored Air. All right. Great pick. I like that pick. I like Air. Um, so this is a good little intro to the Real Talk podcast. If you, uh, if the Raiders fans don't know us, uh, I'm I'm the guy who likes to mess things up a lot um, and really just screw over the whole podcast. So I fucked up. Uh, Dead Reckoning Part Two wasn't on my list, and I was just strictly <laughs> going off. Uh, so that is my sixth of the year. So just scoot everything back. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, John Wick for catching another stray <laughs> drop in one more spot. Um, and also, uh, if you see, if you hear my son crying at any moment, we just we just play through the pain. We just play through it. Everybody. So that's life, uh, man. Yeah, little little warning for the Raiders guys. Uh, but I love how George five. acts like he made the movie John Wick 4. Yeah. <laughs> George, thinks he is George St- Chad Stahelski uh, Carmi. Yeah. Um, my number five though, I have Creed 3. One of my favorite boxing movies. I still prefer Creed 1, but I do think it's a bit better than Creed 2. Um, an 89 out of 100 for myself. Uh, he who will not be named, I think, uh, was a very good villain in this one. Uh, but Michael B. Jordan had an absolutely incredible debut, in my opinion. And did you know that they pulled a lot of influence from anime? For this <laughs> so it's very never very heard that. Epic. I, know, I yeah. never heard uh. that. Yeah, fun fact. Fun fact. Only told by myself. Uh, but the action scenes. What awesome. what scene really are you like. talking about, though? <laughs> it could be anyone. It's it's definitely not the scene where they're in a big stadium and then all of a sudden they're in a cage match. Uh, but I loved it. I thought I really enjoyed it. I thought it was great. That's one of those niche movie facts. Like I don't know if you've yeah. heard the, the about the ticking, the ticking noise in Interstellar. Yeah. There it is. Yeah, it's yeah. Or did you hear that Christopher Nolan hand planted every piece of corn for that movie and sold it for a profit? <laughs> <laughs> he almost became a farmer after it. Didn't didn't use CGI for Oppenheimer either. Pretty crazy guys. Pretty crazy contact. All right, uh, let's move on to George's number five. 
Yeah, my number five, giving it the respect it fucking deserves, uh, John Wick Chapter 4. Um, I, I'm very open about John Wick, in my mind, being the greatest action franchise of all time. I think it's some of the best action choreography we've ever seen. Um, and I, I love that the the story and the characters and the lore don't take a back seat to that. It's still like fully fleshed out. Um, it is my favorite of the franchise. I absolutely love what they did. I agree the runtime can drag a little bit and and we're really pushing like moments where John Wick probably should have died and he kind of just becomes a little superhuman for me. But I still absolutely adore this movie um, that that currently sits at my number five. It's very interchangeable for me with Parabellum. Um, but uh, I still hold John Wick chapter four as the best of the franchise and currently my number five of the year. All that chaos for you to just have it at five. It's I been mean, a I good. Had it, I had it at, oh my I had it, god! I could have, I could have, I could have, I could have had it at six, and you acted like I murdered your baby. Like, what's the difference? That's so subjective. Like, it's a one. Yeah, number bro. I thought you were gonna have it at negative two. <laughs> so low on your list. I was expecting number one. <laughs> Listen, if it's not in your top five, we got problems. So numbers are so arbitrary, man. What's the, there's no difference between batting two ninety nine and three hundred. Come on. Well, yeah, there's 300s that it's get that title, bro. That is the 300. Yeah, I get it. That's All right, big I'm thing. next at number five. I have Bo is Afraid from Ari Aster. Wow. I really, I love divisive films, and I love how some people hate this movie and some people love it, and I really loved it. And it's one of those experiences where while you're watching it, you're so enthralled by the mystery as well as – how unique it was i love seeing things i've never seen before specifically the horror genre but this isn't exactly a horror film but when i go to see an Ari Aster movie i want to see something i've never seen before or at least him tweak something and i think everyone ex was expecting his third horror film you know hereditary midsummer kind of like contemporary versions of rosemary's baby where command you could say but then bo is afraid he just did something completely new something completely unique biggest budget he's been working with so far I love the creativity, the imagination. I love how confusing it is, but also all of the underlying themes, which are dense. And he just gave us something that's never really been done before. And it bombed, didn't make a ton of money, but not every director's movies always perform very well, especially filmmakers like him. I'm really excited about it. And I think it will age a lot better. And I think people will come to understand it more uh, as they watch it throughout the years. I also think Bo is Afraid. Like Tyler, you rewatched it. And I think that's something that not doesn't, warrant a rewatch but requires it because there's so much going on i i liked it but i i liked the first i loved the first half and then it started to lose me a bit more after the play section so i'd be keen to see what i think on rewatch to be fair for me bo's afraid was one of the biggest jumpers i've ever had on rewatch for like any movie in terms of like i liked it when i first saw it i saw it in uh in real imax for my first watch and then rewatched it um at home and it jumped like way up for me i really enjoy the movie it's, it's at 15 right now for me so out of 140 like i have it really really high up and I, yeah bo's afraid I, I really appreciate a lot more on rewatch when i first watched it, i was like this seems a little on the nose and i didn't love a lot of it but my second rewatch i realized there's a lot more nuanced and intricate than i initially gave credit to ari aster for so uh definitely thumbs up good movie all right Seth, sorry just next. just to backtrack oh, sorry, real George. quick I, I didn't mention i've seen 46 new releases this year okay just to mention is it me? They're all John Wick 4. They're all John Wick 4. <laughs> Rewatch it. <laughs> yes, Seth is up. So for me, George, you'll be happy. Mine is John Wick Chapter 4. Um, yeah, there we go. It's So I actually think it's the best of the John Wick franchise for me personally. I think they escalate the stakes that much higher and the set pieces are that much more extravagant. It gave me such a fun time whilst watching. I will say that I do agree I think it pushed the length a little bit too long. I do actually, I did actually quite like the conclusion, but there was a lot of things in there which I think could have been brought down and it didn't need to be necessarily the three hour time length it was. But it also had probably one of my favorite sequences in an action film specifically ever. I am not huge on all our action a lot of times. Um, you know, I like the first two John Wick films, but I really like the third and fourth, the third and fourth. But I think the club scene um, with what was his name? Uh, the, the, the big dude. Scott Adkins, Scott Adkins, yeah. yeah. I, the club scene with him, that kind of elevated this film, all things considered for me. I think that was electric. I loved that sequence. And whilst I agree, it could have been shorter, and I think they did overuse a lot of this, this, the same kind of thing. It was just action to the absolute maximum, and the set pieces made it worth it. Um, so yeah, that is my number five. I have that like a... I've been saying my ratings. Everything so far has been a four, and that is also a four. Yeah, so all four or five so far. I love you, Seth. Thank you. Love you. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, Tyler. Coming at number five for me is uh, Wes Anderson's Asteroid City. So really enjoyed how meta this movie was. And it's it's a complex movie. It's like a play within a movie. And then you have the on-screen part of the play as well as the offstage portions. And it's a lot to track and follow. But by the time the ending comes and you get that, especially the back and forth between Schwartzman and Robbie, it just really pulls a lot of the movie together as well as the dialogue be- between uh, Schwartzman uh, just backstage with other fellow actors. I feel like it really just pulls together all the all the themes of this movie. And the thing I really appreciate the most about Asteroid City or just think is kind of coincidental is how all of the Wes Andersonification memes and TikToks were coming out right before this movie came out. And everyone's like, oh, this is just exactly how you make a Wes Anderson style. Just do center framing. Don't do up and down movements. Have cool pastel colors. And then he just drops his most like complex and profound film he ever has. So I, I just love the fact in my mind that I think so many people from TikTok who had never heard of him before the trend went out to see this movie in theaters and probably hated it. And for me, I kind of just really like that fact that there's people that just like, only went to see it because they saw some little silly trend and were probably like, this movie stinks. It's like, yeah, you were never... You were never really grasping it all along. And uh, Asteroid City, I know it's a pretty polarizing film for a lot of people, but I-, I think he really swung for the fences here, and it worked in a lot of ways for me. All right, Anthony, take us off with your number four for 2023 so far. At number four, I got my boy Tom Cruise. Yes, Mission sir. Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. I also I haven't been doing my four, my ratings, but everything was uh, John Wick 4, four stars, Flash, four stars, Barbie, four stars, and then Asteroid City across the Spider-Verse and Air, I have four and a half stars for each of those. And then Dead Reckoning Part 1, I also have four and a half stars. I thought it was just exactly what I wanted in a Mission Impossible film. I'm a massive fan of the franchise ever since Brian De Palma's first film. Um, and after number two, the somehow the franchise, the films get better and better and better until the peak of Fallout. And I don't think that a better Mission Impossible movie can be made than Fallout. I think it's just the best that can be. Yeah, I agree. Um, but part one of Dead Reckoning was still fantastic. It hit all the beats I'm looking for in this kind of film. It had some really cool resonant themes about AI and the future of technology and the uncertainty of that future um, in our modern lives. And then the stunts are fantastic. It had a lot of humor, um, self-deprecating humor, poking fun at itself. Um, I thought Haley Atwell was outstanding as the new supporting actress. And then Palm, Palm Clementiev was really dynamic as like that nameless assassin. Um, I have this at number three in my Mission Impossible. I was going to talk about yeah. So yeah, I was and, to play something. Yeah, it's just fantastic. Right, my ranking for top three is Fallout, the original, and then this film. Um, I just had oh. an absolute blast. Interesting. I love the original. I, I'm a big I, I have Brian the original De Palma fan. Yeah, De Palma is oh, yeah. one of my all-time favorite directors, and He's, he really it only the franchise is only successful because he did a, such a fantastic job with that first film to really get the gears going and Tom Cruise just doing what he does best. And that's why I love the guy. The guy puts his life on the line just for our entertainment and really cares about the audience and giving them what they want. And people, I think expect massive spectacle for mission Impossible. That's why a lot of young, new people, to mission Impossible maybe don't put the original very high on their list. But I mean, that stunt in the scene with him sneaking down the elevator shaft is just as enthralling as him jumping off a cliff to me. So I love the original too. The, the scene of him jumping off the cliff with the motorcycle, I was like so annoyed before the movie because I was like, why would they show this to us so many times? Like they gave us behind the yeah. scenes and I was stunned by like how my stomach still dropped during that. <laughs> they like, held that shot for like 10 like seconds. Like crazy falling. long. Yeah. And I, I was sitting there, I was like, God, and like the way the camera is angled, we're like kind of following him. It was like the halo leap in Fallout where you're like, you're below him. It's just, I was stunned by like, I saw the scene before the movie and it's still like, made me feel so like queasy and like uncomfortable <laughs> absolutely he's the man all right cam what do you got at number four yeah i think it was a uh, uh, anthony who mentioned it earlier the the springtime wasn't great for movies uh this year but i think my like my top four to me are just like fantastic movies i, I think a lot there's been a lot of good movies this year but i do think these last four are are really great um but at number four i have passed lives a 92 out of 100 or four and a half out of five i just watched it the other day um i actually watched it on barbie and oppenheimer day so it was like a full day of great movies um really enjoyed it super emotional and i'll always mention my review of i've never been this emotional watching a guy get cucked um that's <laughs> that, that that was kind of my biggest takeaway from the thing is he just he was just letting it happen man but it, it very emotional i i really really enjoyed it 
It was an emotional cut. He's a really right? nice guy. He's a very nice, he's really he's a very nice, nice guy. guy. <laughs> Adam, Adam 22 all over again. <laughs> oh my God. That is so funny. Um, all right. Yeah, good, up. good segue into my number four because I share the same number four as Cam, past lives. I figured, um, I figured it'd be on someone else's list. Yeah. Uh, I also haven't been giving my ratings. So Air, Scream 6, and Evil Dead Rise are all three and a half out of fives. Dead Reckoning Part 1 was a four out of five. Uh, Suzumi, John Wick, and uh, Past Lives are all four and a half out of fives. Um, yeah, Past Lives I thought was a fantastic experience. Um, I always say like a New York City backdrop in a movie just elevates it for me like crazy. Just being in the city, uh, it just it, it just adds so much like flavor to a movie. Um, I've also just been infatuated by you know right person wrong time type of films lately. I obviously have seen La La Land like ten times in the last two months. Uh, I recently watched Wong Kar Wai's In the Mood for Love, which I absolutely adored. Um, and Past Lives, another, uh, you know, right there with Michael B. Jordan as a directorial debut of the year. Another really, really strong opening outing. Um, I, I absolutely love this thing. Um, it was really emotional. Um, I, I saw it in a theater, and by the end of it, everyone was just teary-eyed, crying. Um, another just emotional theater experience that I absolutely adored. Um, so sitting at my number four, uh, I've only seen it once, and I really do think after a second watch it could go to a five out of five um so i'd be curious to see how it holds up for me but right now four out of four and a half out of five sitting at my number four spot well said well said all right my number four in the year is the return of matt damon and ben affleck together with air like you said george we're getting so many biopics the last few years everything has to be turned into a biopic like the origin story of mayonnaise who created mayonnaise Flaming hot Cheetos. <laughs> but i think <laughs> this one was done so well because of the characters the acting staying true to the story making the story about the people who created the shoe and brought nike to such fame versus making the movie about michael jordan which was i think a great decision about the the me basically the meeting with the mother as well and i think that you know ben is such a talented director people forget he's won a couple oscars uh, co-writing as well as winning best picture for Argo, Argo, fuck yourself. This guy is probably the best triple threat in Hollywood right now in terms of writer, director, actor until because Clint's not doing it anymore, really. But I think right now he's the best there is at that and, and producer. So he's he's a quadruple threat. He's so talented. Then Matt is just one of the most reliable actors in the history of cinema, specifically this century, for sure. You always know you're going to get some something great out of him. He's very reliable. He does so much but he makes it seem so easy and look like he's just like a completely different person. And airs an awesome story. And like Anthony said, everyone knows the outcome, but you're still watching like, I hope, I hope they get Jordan to sign this deal. How are they going to convince him? It's like, you already know, but that's how good the storytelling is. And I loved air. Yeah. Well, one thing about air that I love and Tyler had mentioned it on our review when we did it, like Michael Jordan's a larger than life person. So I love that they didn't like, cast like someone actually to play him and like shove it down our throat that they spend so much time on like the business aspect of it uh it's like oppenheimer where like you know the story kind of but like it turns into a thriller at one point because of how invested you are and how like brilliantly written this film is which again quadruple threat ben affleck right there so many threats so many threats <laughs> <laughs> all right seth you're up yeah, so my number four is actually an MCU film, and that is Guardians of the Galaxy 3, of course. Uh, just a massive surprise to me, although maybe oh, not a surprise, because I feel like as much as the MCU I don't like, the Guardians have always been the thing that have been the refreshing part of it. I think James Gunn has a unique flair. He introduces it to the characters. I think it's genuinely funny, which is contrary to a lot of MCU films, in my opinion. I think it works on an emotional level and on a comedic level. And I think the structure of this one was a really, really good send-off for characters who I enjoy watching over and over again. Um, I did think, you know, there were, there were certain issues with it, nothing major. I did think it was a little bit convoluted, perhaps a little bit too long at points. But I just think this is a really good send-off. It's, for me, honestly, like, I don't have... So this, this is where I go from 4s to 4.5s. I don't have many uh, superhero movies rated around, like, a 4.5, a 5, etc., if I had to guess, I'd say this is like a top five, top ten superhero movie ever for me, purely because of the emotional response I had. And I think, George, you mentioned this in, in our video, watching it with, with my fiance who's a massive MCU fan as well and seeing how happy it made her kind of 
made a massive difference and impacted my experience. Uh, so yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy 3 is my number four, and that is the start of the, the 4.5 out of 5s. Yeah, that was how I felt watching Barbie with Victoria. Just like yeah. the experience of like watching her react to like her childhood and how it impacted Being her. Being someone you love, love something is also kind of an impact on you. It's not just yeah. like the film, but the yeah, experience. The film. Definitely elevates the experience for sure. All right, Tyler. What you got, number four? Yeah, so we've talked about it a bunch already, so I won't I won't add too much to it. But Air, I absolutely loved it. Um, for me, Argo is probably still my favorite Ben Affleck movie, but I think I truly think Air is his best work as director. And I think Oppenheimer has like the most stacked cast and the great performances this year. But Air still, I think, has a cast that has the most chemistry on the year. Jason Bateman, Chris Messina, Ben Affleck, uh, Matt Damon, they all played off each other so brilliantly. Viola Davis throwing in the dramatic punches as well with her emotional scenes as Jordan's mother. This cast just oozed chemistry from the very intro of this movie, the style with the, you know, the, the 70s, 80s music. It brings you through a quick montage to get you immediately immersed in that era. Just super, super fun and immersive movie that, like we said, it's a story we all know. Like we knew the outcome of the end, but still it was so enthralling to see it all come together. And I will just shout out, you know, we talked about Barbie a bit, talking about, you know, writers, directors, actors. I'd say Greta Gerwig's up there with Ben, ben Affleck in terms of, you know, triple threats. She doesn't have the... Not only she has a wait no GG NB production for Barbie, so she's also a quadruple threat. Shout out Greta Gerwig, you and Ben Affleck are are the best quadruple threats in Hollywood right now. Well, I'm I argue in terms of quadruple threat, acting, writing, directing, producing in a movie versus Greta is not always doesn't really star in her own movies. Fair. You know she, what I mean? She's so only doing like two okay, at a time. Okay, I see what you she mean. She only does yeah, two at a time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So she, yeah. So that's, that's what I mean in terms of. And like that's why you compared threat. him to Clint. Clint, Clint, Clint starred that, in many you know, movies he directed. Right. Yeah. For sure, makes sense. Gotcha. I see what you mean. You guys, nice job. Raiders. You almost got canceled, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, Raiders boys, you guys recommended to me when I visited you, um, House of the Devil, and that was like my first. Uh, oh yeah, that was like one of the earliest Greta Gerwig performances. That oh, is that the Ti West one that you introduced? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. The old Ti West movie. I, I thought that was great. I really, yeah. it's a fantastic movie. I've been yeah, sending yeah. a web of. I've been recommending that to people for years. <laughs> I've created like a web of people who now have seen it. Video like last week. It's, it's one a one of my great, videos. great movie. Yeah. I, I, once you realize what's going on in that film, it's like holy fuck. Yeah. I, I watched that on the plane, and like every so often a scene popped up, and I was like closing my laptop. I was like, I don't want people to think I'm like some weirdo watching some weird shit right now. <laughs> it's messed up. All right, let's get to round three. Anthony, you're going to take us away with your number three, or not round three, but third of the year. Number, th number three, I have Celine Song's Past Lives. I, I found it to be uh, the most human tale of the year. Deeply resonant, deeply emotional, um, an incredible uh, relationship drama about the complication, the complicated nature of life and trying to find a partner and connecting with people. And like you said earlier, right person, wrong time. I think we all, in some capacity, go through experiences like that or we meet people and sometimes life just doesn't work out. And that's, that is life. It's complex and you can never plan things. You can never set too many, you can't ex set expectations on your life and um, because you kind of have to go with what life gives you in a lot of ways. Um, I found it to be an incredibly moving film, and the Celine Song she could have gone a little bit more with a little bit more bite, um, but she chose a more nuanced approach. She could have gone with maybe the two of them sleep together, and then it complicates things. Um, but I think she wisely Hollywood. chose she cho she chose to make it <laughs> just about um, interpersonal dynamics and um, more personal than physical. Um, and you can have an intimate relationship with someone without touching them in, in terms of several several months of these two characters speaking over Skype. Um, I love the Skype. I, it, they, the movie, I was like, I know this technology. I was cracking up with the sound effects. Um, and I think everybody at some point in their lives possibly goes through like chatting with someone long distance in some way and how that can be difficult, how that can be emotionally draining to not actually have that person with you. And also the choices we make in life lead us down a path where we are now. And it's, it's just a very complex film about human dynamics. Incredibly moving. Um, I just found it to be so well written, so well shot too on, on film in New York City. I'm a big fan of old New York City films um, from the 70s and 60s. And uh, we don't get too many films shot in New York City like this, where most of it's in New York City um, because it's pretty expensive. But I also love South Korean cinema. I'm a massive South Korean cinema fan, so to get this combination of two um, aspects of film that I love kind of put into one 
movie I just found to be absolutely brilliant. Uh, one of the best debuts in recent memory. And um, I hope this gets a lot of awards recognition down the line. I, I expect it to. Was it was it shot on film, Past Lives? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't. Actually, I've not seen it. Yet. It's not out here yet. I didn't know it was shot on film. Interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. cool. It's also uh, it, it's like very loosely based on Celine songs, uh, like an encounter she had yeah, similar did situation, it, right? uh, which is why I think she took like the more reserved approach and like not mm -hmm. like inflating the story, like Anthony said, like making them sleep together or something. Like she wanted to make it as true as possibly can be. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That makes sense because they're so specific it to, that it's based on real life. Yeah, that's a very interesting situation to be like in a bar sandwiched between like your wife and her childhood like <laughs> lover or like very very close the person friend. she's <laughs> destined to be with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can <laughs> be me. Um, All right, Cam. Yeah, moving on. Number three. Uh, I I like hid my letterbox list because I did a little reshuffling so this might shock the real talk guys but it also might not matter to them because it's my ranking and they probably don't care uh but at number three i have guardians of the galaxy volume three um this is another movie from this year that i started at five star um and i kept at a five star but after seeing another movie this year um that i don't necessarily think is five star but i do think is better than this one uh, a little tease so maybe what my number two or one is um I moved it down just ever so slightly. So this is a 94 out of 100 now, uh, uh, four and a half out of five, right on the cusp. Um, I absolutely love Guardians. I love the MCU, big MCU nerd, if you guys uh, don't know. Um, so this one is one of my favorites. I think it hit the emotion. I think James Gunn just knows how to take these characters and make you care about them. Um, I, I fucking love it. Nothing bad to say about it at all, but did drop a little bit. All right. George, uh... you're up. Uh, another perfect segue. George and I are I. Best, best friends. Yeah, because you guys my... are holding hands the whole episode. <laughs> sure. I I will say though, I'm I'm on the opposite side of Cam. I've actually recently raised this from a four and a half to a five mm -hmm. out of five star. Um, after my fifth watch of it, um, it just it it's impressing me and blowing me away how this movie just hits all of its beats. Regard, I've seen it five times now. I I cried on the fifth watch i hysterically laughed on the fifth watch um I, I still adore this movie more and more every single time um i i love the the unique nature of the guardians compared to the rest of the mcu i love what james gunn does incorporating uh you know the 80s soundtrack and a very distinct aesthetic to this movie that i just i i fucking adore diving deeper into rocket's backstory just killed me emotionally uh, on more occasions than one um, I, I really, really, really adore this movie. It's it's my number two MCU movie right now. Um, maybe eventually it'll go down to a four and a half out of five again. Maybe my five out of five is a little bit of bias, but the, the way this movie makes me feel, I feel like I'd be doing it a disservice not giving it a five out of five for, for at least a, a little bit of time. So if that's you're watching a film five times in like a few months, you should probably <laughs> it's probably going to yeah. be yeah. eventually yeah. it's going to be a five out of five. So yeah, yeah, right right now, five out of five for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, my number three of the year. All righty. My number three on the year is Past Lives also. And to try to say something a little different than everyone else, but to bounce off George... You know, I love New York films as well, but there's a lot of movies made in cities, Boston, New York City, L.A., that don't look good or don't use the city to their advantage to tell a story. But Past Lives does. They use that to create basically another character in the film, just like with Seoul in the film in, Korea, in South Korea as well. And it's a really special film, highly relatable, especially when you see the old technology of like Skype. Well, technically, that's old technology of Skype and those <laughs> old MacBooks and you know, whether you're in college or you're in long distance relationships, I'm sure a lot of us have been in them. I've been in a few and just the the excitement of being able to communicate with somebody whenever you want constantly. Technology brings that at first sort of like a honeymoon phase, but then the experience of technical difficulties or busy schedules and how you fall out of touch eventually and how the technology becomes an, a tool against your communication in a lot of ways. And you know, I love films about fate and determinism, and this movie and the story challenges that because it depends on if she stays in Korea. If her family never left South Korea, she probably would have ended up marrying this person and living the cultural lifestyle of her where she would have been in the hierarchy of South Korea. And that's why I love when there are two different types of masculinity. She's like, he's so masculine in like a very South Korean way. He's like, she's so Korean, and versus the husband that she finds organically in America. It's a really beautiful story about 
two different lives that this character could have had. And it's sort of very seldom you get to experience what the other life, your path, your other path your life could have taken if you had followed a different route, if you never broke up with this person, maybe if you got together with that person, what your life could have been like to kind of peer behind the curtain of a different reality of yours. I thought that was so fascinating to explore in a kind of a triangle relationship, but not exactly a triangle. And I wouldn't even describe him as a cuck, but maybe an emotional <laughs> cuck camp. <laughs> but I thought it was a beautiful film. Just a little bit. Just first a little bit. shot, first shot in theaters. I was like, oh, beautiful. It's on film. This is incredible. Sign me up right away. Is it me? It's me, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So my, th I was, I was grappling between two and three for this film. I think, I'm, I think I'm, I'm all right with this. I'm gonna go for Spider Man Across the Spider Verse and the three. Um, I think that a, a film like this, it's very rare that a sequel managed to meet the levels of of just the monumental predecessor. And I do think it does. I think it's around the same quality for me as the first one, which is very rare that, that happens. Um, I actually think it's along with the first the Marvel's best project to date, in my opinion. I think the Spider Verse films or just a level of artistry, a level of inspiration, a level of um, ambition that, that, that transcends, you know, superhero genre, superhero films. And I think they're just full of heart, emotion. Um, and whilst I think Across the Spider-Verse, I think I've, I've, only, I've only seen it once. And I think, you know, it's important to watch things like this twice. I love the different graphical styles and that's such a unique touch. We rarely see that. And especially with the budget it had. I, the budget wasn't crazy hard on Across the Spider-Verse. 100, 100 million. million. Yeah, 100 million, and we've seen with Pixar films up at the three, four hundred range, the amount they put into this is just incredible. And I think it's in an era we're in where it's just constant multiverse storytelling. This is that at the finest level, and that, that is tricky to attain because so many people are trying it, so many companies are trying it, whatever. Um, the only knock I have, I do think, in the kind of final act, it does lose its sense a little bit and loses direction of which way it wants to take. But I don't think that's a huge knock in any way. I do have this at a 4.5 out of 5. I think. It did meet the level of the original. It actually surpassed my expectations, especially given that it's a part one, which is very, very tricky to do because you are left in anticipation for the next film. And it's difficult to conclude that film in the way you want to. Um, but yeah, for me, it's one of Marvel's best, project, pro best projects today, along with the first one. Um, and it's a 4.5 out of 5. And that is my number three. Nice, nice. Um... George, thanks for Seth. Thanks, thanks for the respect. <laughs> two, yeah. two, two superhero movies in Seth's top five. Crazy, wow. isn't it? Wow. <laughs> and, a, and a movie about jeans. Yeah. Who thought? <laughs> um, All right, Tyler. Yeah, so a lot of people already talked about past lives. That's my number three. So I'll kind of talk about something that none of you guys have talked about since, uh, or just my impact of it, because all this, all the positives you guys have mentioned, I absolutely agree with. I will say Greta Lee was really, really great in this. I would love to see her get some buzz come award season. Uh, John Magaro is great as well. He's also in Showing Up, which is a Kelly Reichardt film with, uh, uh, what's her name, Michelle Williams from earlier this year. So John Magaro is having a pretty solid year for these small projects. Um, but for me with past lives, like the trailer when it came out, it kind of blew up film Twitter. Everyone's like, oh my God, this movie's going to break me. It got definitely like went mega viral on film Twitter. People just say like, this movie's going to be incredible. For me, I was kind of unsure with the trailer because I was worried like, how much will I be able to empathize and buy into this when it's like, if I was in that situation, it's like, you've already moved on. You're already married. This is like 20 years ago. I get like, you probably have such a personal connection, but like at some point you kind of just got to be like, you're in a committed relationship with your husband. And like, obviously I know they never really crossed that line, which I appreciate they did. But still like Cam says, it does get to the point where it's like, pretty emotionally cucking like the bar scene and all that and it's like like for me i would be like oh, awfully uncomfortable with that but it works in this movie and the big thing for me is like the trailers made me think like oh it's gonna be a new guy or a guy from her past life coming in interrupting a relationship and then she's gonna be split on where she's gonna go but when you actually watch the movie it's a lot more about the culture of her past life conflicting with her culture in america and it's much less about like obviously there is a, a love and connection for them the, the man who comes from South Korea from her past life, but it's a lot more about the culture and leaving that behind and trying to mix your South Korean heritage with your new American culture and realizing, you know, where is your place in this world? Did you make the right decision to move? Did you, should you have tried to stay back after your family kind of moved you? Should you have tried to return to South Korea? So the fact that it ended up being a lot more about culture than it was really about the relationship made it end up working for me when I went into it a little skeptical. So past lives, I thought it was a great debut. Um, yeah. Well said. All right, Anthony. Number two of 2023. What oh, do you man. have? It's time for the top two. I got Bo is Afraid as my number two wow. film. Wow. I thought, I think it's absolutely brilliant and genius. Totally floored me. 
I love movies that push the boundaries of storytelling and give us something completely new. And Ari Aster had, thanks to his success with A24, with his first two, with his other two films, they just gave him free reign to do what he wants. And that's what you want for an artist like his, his caliber to just be able to try things. And I think a lot of people might forget that um, filmmaking is an art form and art form doesn't have to follow the rules of the mainstream. And it can be surrealist and it can be abstract and it can be more about ideas than an actual plot. And I find this film to be just a series of metaphors, a gigantic metaphor for ideas and themes. And you don't have to make it about, you know, a villain in an, in an, or an antagonist and a hero trying to do something. It can be about um, more just human ideas and human themes and expressing that with visuals and with storytelling. And it doesn't have to be what you see in other movies. And for Ari Aster's filmography, I think it's, it's really important for him to step outside of the traditional horror genre and show audiences that he's a lot more than just a horror director which i think a lot of people might refer to him as but now i think that he's really evolving ironically he actually wrote this script 10 years ago when he was still an undiscovered talent um so this has probably been with him for a very long time and i feel like it's it's a movie that he put everything into um and he really made it work and joaquin carries that movie on his shoulders plus it was just so brilliantly filmed um, the production design and the rest of the cast is outstanding. And this movie just, it's basically like three different chapters and each chapter is different from the one before it. Um, and I found myself completely enthralled and speechless by the time the movie was over and the credits were rolling. It is a polarizing movie. And I think that's, that's a great thing because so, so it reminds me of someone like David Lynch, where David Lynch, you either love him or you hate him. Um, and a lot of people struggle to find out what the meaning is for all of his films, but that's not the point. The point is just, does it make you feel something? It's look, it's like looking at an abstract painting. It's like looking at a surrealist art. Um, it doesn't have to make sense, but it more importantly, doesn't make you feel about things a certain way. Um, and I found this to be the most, in, in a way, the bravest film of the year that I've seen so far. And I absolutely adored it. I often think that. If you're a director and, and you see your film is polarizing, you've accomplished your work anyway. And I think Ariasta knows that. Ariasta makes films for him. Are you? How high are you two on the on his previous two feature films? I Huge. love them. I love, love them. them. Actually, so I Midsummer is my favorite. Midsummer is my favorite. I like Hereditary more, yeah. but I think they're both terrific. Midsummer supremacy. Good yeah, work. Yeah, I I am actually a, a bit lower on Midsummer than everyone else. I think Hereditary for me is definitely his best work, but I do actually really want to rewatch Bo is Afraid again, because I think the first hour and a half is so good. And it really depends on what you connect with, because it is so abstract and as, as a work of art. Um, but that's an interesting pick. I didn't think anyone would have it in the top five, to be honest. I quite like it. And on top of all of that, yeah. you can add in, oh, my kid's fine. On top of all that, you can add in a very large penis and give it antlers and just let it stab. <laughs> Make it a so monster. Pretty, penis yeah, monster. Cool. I think it's, cool. um the movie's overwhelming. Um, and so... I think it, it. you need to watch it a couple of times to fully grasp what he's doing. I'll be yeah, really I curious. Sorry, I, I'll be really curious coming like uh, up on awards season. I could see Bo is Afraid being like a sneaky four or five nomination movie, especially in like the tech categories. And then given Napoleon coming out, I'll be even more curious to if see it comes out. if it comes out. Yeah. But I'd be even more curious to see if Joaquin Phoenix will be considered for like a dual Best Actor nomination because they're two huge roles as well. Right? Yeah, so they're, they're two huge role. roles where he's clearly putting the movie on his back. Um, so I'd be very curious to see how the rest of the year pans out in like the best actor category. And if, you know, people will start taking like giving Joaquin Phoenix two best actor nominations seriously. Yeah, I, I think he'll definitely go in for Napoleon, but I think Bo is afraid just didn't perform well. It might be too weird for Oscar voters to even yeah. want to see it, let alone vote for him. So. I'd be surprised if he gets any Oscar nominations, honestly. I don't expect it to. Yeah. Uh, movies like that often, it's especially weird. because it's, it's too weird, too weird and it came out too early in the year for yeah. really to hit the Oscar season. But we must move on to Cam's uh, second on the year. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I, this, like, for some reason, I always just rate movies super high. I'm different from most in the sense that I'll rate something super high and then bring it down a little bit. So again, another movie that started at a five out of five for me and has dropped a little bit to a four and a half, uh, 94 out of hundred as well. Oppenheimer is my number two. Uh, I don't have to harp on it too much because I'm fairly confident it might be on someone else's list at some point. Uh -huh. So I, I will just say like the sound design of this thing and the Ludwig Gorenson score 
best best of the year um in my opinion i absolutely loved all of that um uh, anthony and james i said on my review the only reason i hold it back from like a five out of five is it kind of felt like a car like stopping and starting at moments like with how intense it gets and then it goes super slow and then it gets super intense and then slower which i don't think uh is a, is a horrible thing i just feel like that holds it back a little bit for me but yeah robert downey um as I mentioned, huge, huge MCU guy. So I always see him as Iron Man. I have like a shrine to Iron Man right across from me. Um, but I think in this one, he absolutely steered clear of any Iron Man comparisons and just stole the show, in my opinion, and will most certainly win Best uh, Supporting Actor unless we see something crazy come out, or at least I hope he does. Um, but fantastic movie. I'm sure you all will mention it, so I don't have to go into it too much and maybe george might even mention it right now but i'd be shocked <laughs> i'd be shocked if it's george isn't mentioned no uh, no uh, uh, yeah fine. unfortunately oh. cam and i's in sync list is, is coming to an end uh my number two is spider-man across the spider-verse um i i adore uh, uh, into the spider-verse and i think across the spider-verse just takes everything i love about that movie and just amplifies it um, I, I like the the diving into our characters a little bit more, the relationship between Miles and his parents, Miles and Gwen. There's a lot of themes of, uh, you know, what's morally correct in a certain situation that I think this movie just handles very well. Um, the soundtrack, uh, Metro absolutely snapped on it. Uh, it, it. It's unbelievable. I've been going back and forth between uh, the Across Spider-Verse soundtrack and the Oppenheimer score at the gym for the last like week or so. Uh, and it's just been uh, a recipe for for success in the gains department. Um, <laughs> but, PR, new PR, new PR. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I, I absolutely adore Across Spider-Verse. Um, obviously, everything that can be said about the animation and the, the over 250 animation styles um it, it's been said before so I, I don't need to harp on that at all uh again bringing up awards season i'll be very curious to see if this gets in a nomination for best picture i i really hope it does assuming don't think it will will it because yeah i, I, don't, I, get I, it. I don't, don't understand why animation doesn't come up and i don't i don't know sense. i'm, I'm holding has... out hope but I, i'm really really hoping because i think this film just even if you don't love the story or the characters the, the craftsmanship of this film alone uh in my opinion uh, makes it deserving of a best picture nomination so uh my number two of the year sitting at a a five out of five currently um across the spider-verse yeah i think it's just because same thing with horror horror and animation seldom ever get best picture noms because i think the academy doesn't want to dilute the prestige of drama yeah. in my opinion yeah. so if i they think there's some like wartime nazis in it probably would get nominated <laughs> i guess the and, academy yeah. loves world war ii movies the seventh true. film was always get nominated always yeah every year all right time for my number two on the year i got mission impossible dead reckoning part one it's everything i wanted i knew it would not top or technically really match fallout that's just a perfect movie i think the best action movie of the century possibly and i was just expecting something pretty close and just to enjoy an incredible time with Tom Cruise for two and a half hours, which I did. And this movie delivered in every aspect. I think it was maybe the most fun Mission Impossible movie of all time as well. I had a terrific time. And we're huge Mission Impossible fans. We have been like our whole lives. So we always get excited and giddy whenever they got a new one coming out. So I'm, I'm ecstatic that we have back-to-back -back years with, with Tommy C in the summertime, baby, with Ethan Hunt. And I thought it was a really solid part one to a two-parter. Slow start, lots of exposition building because technically it's exposition being built for two movies. And I think once it gets going, it's just exceptional. It does not let you go. Seeing this in IMAX was an incredible sensational experience. The entire audience was in tune with the film, especially on the stunts. When he jumped over the cliff, I'd never been in a theater that was so quiet where everyone held their breath for about 15 seconds. It was such an odd and intriguing experience to sit in and just be with a giant room full of people for that the anticipation was massive and they ended it really well and it felt like a solid ending for a part one and once it was over i was like can we just hit play on part two right now i'm dying to see the next chapter in this movie and i can't wait for next year to see part two but they delivered and tom and christopher mcquarrie they are one of the best storytelling duos in hollywood and in cinema today and my God, they are so important for film right now and for cinema and for movie theaters. And we need them so much. Where Last does that thing. land on your, sorry, George, where does that land on your Mission Impossible ranking? 
I put it at three, so I got Fallout, Mission Impossible, the OG, and then oh, okay. Dead Reckoning. Interesting, interesting. No, no Rogue Nation love. I got that four. Okay, I'll accept it. I'll accept I got that four. Yeah, I got Rogue Nation <laughs> four too. Uh, is it me? Yeah, cool. Uh, yes, sir. So my number two is is Asteroid City. Um, it was between this and Spider Verse for two. I think I, I like this just slightly more. Um, I'm a Wes fan. I'm not like a, a huge. I guess Wes has got like a, a cult following. I'm not the biggest Wes, Wes Anderson fan ever, but I actually recently ticked off a lot of his work. I'd only seen sort of four or, or so of his films uh, in anticipation for Asteroid City, and I think it was just incredible. I think it's, in my opinion, I have it as his second best film to date, um, just under Grand Poo Best Hotel, which is like kind of one I watched as a kid and I hold on to so dearly. I think it's incredible. Um, and I think it was just a like a nihilistic deconstruction of, of performing arts, a soulful exploration of performing arts, um, a look at American traditions as well, which was really interesting. I thought the cast were really, really terrific, especially Jason Schwartzman and obviously Scarlett Johansson is the main two. It's you saying a, a Wes Anderson film has good production and the sets are incredible is kind of boring now because everyone already knows that's going to be a sole focus. Um, but contrary to some of his other films, especially the French Dispatch, which I wasn't huge on, and I think that's the great thing about Wes Anderson, for example, like George has French Dispatch at like one or two, whereas I have French Dispatch as last and George has Asteroid City at last, so or one of the last. And I think it's really interesting because any of his films can go anywhere. And I think this really hit me on an emotional level. Um, and it left me with a feeling of existential dread, but also a feeling of wonderment throughout and just being in complete awe. Um, and I do think it's one of his best words today. And I, I, uh, I, I definitely understand why people don't like it because I said in my review, this is like Wes Anderson doing his best Wes Anderson impression. It's so Wes Anderson, it's unbelievable. So if you don't like him, if you're not a fan of his style, you're, you, you're, you're not going to like this film at all. But for a Wes Anderson, I guess, fan like me, I, I do think this is one of his better works. I, and not just on a visual sense, on an emotional sense as well, it really connected. Um, this is also a 4.5 for me. I've only seen it once. I do think this could be a 5 in the future, maybe. I'm a huge Wes Anderson fan. We, we always have been since the early days of us getting into movies. So we've been part of that cult. And I agree. I think French Dispatch, I have it at the bottom of my ranking as well because I couldn't connect to it. I've seen yeah. it twice and I just couldn't connect to it. And it was yeah. a little too overwhelming. But then I think that Asteroid City was him getting back to what he does best yeah. with the style but also keeping the emotional connection you have with the characters. And then, ironically, some of his less stylish, stylish films are so emotionally connective that you can really relate to the characters. So it's interesting to see how his career has evolved. It was like the perfect balance between the two mm -hmm. aspects of his, of his film telling, I think. It was, um, yeah, definitely one of his best works for me today. Nice. All right, Tyler, what do you got for your number two? Yeah, so um, I haven't been saying my ratings, but my top two are both five stars for me. So five star Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Call it comic book fatigue, or maybe I'm just falling out of love mostly with comic book movies over the past couple of years. But this one was so refreshing and brought me right back in. And Spider-Verse is obviously great as well. It was also my top 10. But immediately when I watched this movie, I felt like the two hour and a half runtime just absolutely flew by for me. I was laughing. I cried. And then I rewatched it a couple of weeks later in theaters. And just from like the opening sequence of like playing creep by Radiohead, like I just started crying. I was like, I know where this is going. This is already making me emotional. And I still laughed. And both on first watch and rewatch, the two hours and a half, just both times for me, just flew by completely. I feel like this movie's paced incredibly. Like it's just like changing set pieces, changing sequences the entire time. I think of the set design of this, I know a lot of it's going to be like computer generated, but I think the creativity that went into the creature designs, the set designs, all the different worlds they go to was definitely like a very big stretch for the MCU in terms of, I feel like we've seen stuff like quantum mania for me. I felt like looked really bland in a lot of the set pieces, whereas gardens of the galaxy volume three was so fresh and exciting. And obviously all the performances were incredible in this. Um, Chuck Woody Wooji was absolutely incredible. Um, and yeah, I just felt like this was such a great send off, a uh, great soundtrack once again. And for James Gunn's swan song to the MCU and just buttoning up his trilogy of Guardians movies, really don't see any way he could have done it any better than that. So really excited to see the direction he goes with DC now. But yeah, Guardians 3, definitely a, definitely a huge favorite amount of the year. Nice. All right, we're in the final round, boys. The number one of the year. Anthony, kick us off. What is your number one of 2023 so far? I've seen this uh, twice now, um, and I it's the only five-star rating I have for 2023 so far, and that's Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. I think it's... I, I like to let movies sit before I have like too quick of reactions of saying something is like the greatest I've seen or best I've seen, but 
I know right out of the theater, I said it was the best movie I've seen since Parasite um, in 2019. And I had a similar reaction to Parasite where once the credits rolled, I was like, I, I saw it by myself and I was like, holy fuck, that was unbelievable. I haven't seen a movie like that in a long time. And I had the same reaction to Oppenheimer where the credits were rolling and I was just jaw on the floor, overwhelmed um, emotionally and mentally. Uh, I found it to be such a brilliant depiction of this complex part of our history of humanity. Um, and Christopher Nolan, in terms of storytelling, he did new things with the surrealist qualities, the magic realism he put in the film, um, really putting us into the the mind and headspace of this character. And and I thought it was so brilliant to show no wartime uh, sequences, to, to not talk about the no, no sequences of generals. There's no sequences of the president until until actually Oppenheimer meets with the president. So to keep the set the story really centered around this person and then objectively with uh downey's character strauss during his hearing i thought it was a really in incredible take on what was going on and it's just so fascinating to see that the most impactful moment in history and the most one of the most devastating probably the most devastating thing that ever happened in humanity it all came from a group of people doing mathematics um and different kinds of sciences just writing on paper and then just some scribbles on a chalkboard and some paper led to the most devastating act in human in human history. I found it to be it's just a very fascinating thing to discuss and observe and look back on. And a lot of people might find it to be a questionable thing to put in a movie. But I think that, you know, these things need to be told. And it's a it's a major part of our history. And he did it with so so much class and so much object, so much just objective artistic integrity um the filmmaking so much imax footage seeing it projected onto full frame imax with that sound with that crystal clear picture i found it to be one of the most riveting visual feasts i've ever seen in a theater and the sound design was excellent and he made the test sequence of the trinity test feel like the most suspenseful terrifying and thrilling uh, cinematic moments i've seen in many years and i was the two minutes to the countdown I was just in my seat, like shuffling, like I was so on edge. I was like adjusting my glasses. I was like, oh my, fu holy fuck, holy fuck. And it, it was just an uh, incredible feat of filmmaking. I would say, I'm not sure if it's Nolan's best film. I can't say that right now. I, need, I really need to watch it a few more times and give it some more time. Um, but I do think it's his greatest feat as a storyteller and his greatest artistic achievement as a filmmaker. Um, and I was just absolutely floored by it. I expect this to win um, several Oscars. I have it predicted to win seven Oscars um, in February. So I think it's a standout of the year so far, and it's going to be really hard for anything to beat it. Cam, what do you got for number All one? Right. Yeah, I, uh, I expect I'll be the only one a little different today. So congrats on the hive mind, everybody. But uh, my number <laughs> one... <laughs> my number one is uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Um, I think it... I, I don't have it as high as Into the Spider-Verse, but given that's a perfect 100 out of 100 for myself, uh, it, it would never reach that status. But I, I do like absolutely love Across the Spider-Verse. I thought it was a beautiful achievement in animation and just like movies in general. Um, 98 out of 100 for myself. Uh, my only 5 out of 5 of the year. Um, I'll probably end up raising some others. We'll see. But um, yeah, currently my highest for sure. Everything that was said about it from everyone, and I, I reiterate, I don't want to harp on it too much because I know you guys went into it, but I just think the I, I was blown away the entire time I was in theaters, and I and I was with Oppenheimer as well. Um, I just think this, like the styles of, and George mentioned it, the two hundred fifty plus animation styles. There, this is like the largest production of an animated uh, movie ever. It, and only on a hundred million dollar budget is absolutely insane. Like, like uh, Seth said, like there are Pixar movies that cost 330 million or something like that and don't come anywhere near looking like this. So just that they were able to do that. doesn't look, it doesn't sound like a uh, production was all that great, but um, uh, I hope that everyone who worked on it at least feels a little bit of an achievement because what they created was so damn good um, in my opinion. So yeah, it's my number one of the year. Um, I'd be shocked if it gets passed, but I, I, I just absolutely adore it. Yeah, you keep that hundred million budget when you ain't overtime to anybody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's uh, that's, it's that's uh, fair. more so uh, <laughs> 2D, 2D, 2D animation is uh, 2D animation is much less expensive than computer generated animation. Yeah. So that's a yeah. uh, reason for the budget. It's a lot cheaper to make. 
but yeah. it's still like the most impressive animated animation I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. They should have right. always be 2D then because yeah. it looks better. <laughs> All right, George, what's your number one of the year? Yeah, no, no surprise here. My number one is Oppenheimer, obviously, wow. echoing uh, everything Anthony said. Um, that bomb test sequence, I mean, I was the same thing that Anthony said. I'm sitting in my chair. Even on second watch, I'm like, I can't believe what I'm about to just watch. It feels like a roller coaster where you're just like keep going up and up and up and the countdown right. starts. Yeah. Countdown starts start, starting at 10, 9, 8, and then it just drops. And it's just, it, it, that is one of my favorite scenes that I've seen in a very long time. Um, this is the perfect biopic for Christopher Nolan to have taken over um, because it goes beyond being a biopic. It turns into this, this mystery thriller semi horror movie at times. And, and I think Christopher Nolan's uh, it, just incredible filmmaking tactics, his, his eye for, for a script and for how he's going to translate that script into a, a massive blockbuster was just a perfect combination to tell the story of the atomic bomb. Um, I, I mean, not enough can be said about the cast. Obviously we all know it to be one of the most stacked casts of the year, if not ever. Um, Killian Murphy being my front runner right now for best actor, Robert Downey Jr. being my front runner right now for supporting actor. Emily Blunt's gonna get a nomination. I wouldn't be mad with like a fucking Matt Damon nomination. I think everyone was so goddamn incredible in this movie. Um, Ludwig Göransson's score is heart pounding. It, it's it's infectious. It's it's just brilliant, and the sound design just made me feel like I was taking a bomb to the chest multiple times. Um, I see a lot of discourse on the runtime. Personally, didn't mind it at all. I think this movie actually flew by just because of how quickly paced it was and just how dialogue driven it was and just how you had to just be locked in the entire time. Um, I've been seeing a lot of people say, you know, you describe a, a black and white movie shot on film about the atomic bomb. You would think this movie came out in the 70s, um, but it's a 2023 masterpiece and it's my current number one of the year. And I'll be surprised if, if, if something tops this for me on the year. Dune 2 seems like it could be the only one that might come close, but we'll see if that even comes out this year. Maybe Killers of the Flower Moon too, but yeah, I'm going to segue yeah. into my number one, which is also Oppenheimer, which is nothing short of remarkable. Every aspect of the film from a production standpoint, acting, writing, editing, everything is the best I've seen of the year. Potentially the best of Nolan's career. Hoyt Van Hoytema's visuals are astounding, whether we're with the aerial photography or the IMAX portrait close-ups close with the 65mm IMAX film, as well as the black and white. But the way that he tells the objective and subjective story in a nonlinear fashion is so complex but digestible because of the incredible editing and, and phenomenal script that Nolan wrote. And it's astounding to make a three-hour wartime epic about Oppenheimer, the physicist who directed the Manhattan Project, three hours, holding $75 million its opening weekend domestic, absurd, rated R, and it's really important for the historical context of understanding what happened in World War II. You know, mostly th things we learn about just a day in class one day in like sixth grade, chalked up to a couple of footnotes in history. Everyone kind of knows the name, but to give historical context to why this program was created, what happened in World War II and why the bombs were dropped, it's still up for debate as to whether it's the right decision or not. But to add a perspective that most people don't know, I think that's really important for the culture the global culture to understand more the significance of the bombings and why it occurred. I mean, everything you guys said, the acting, Hillian carrying this movie on his shoulders, absurdly talented. We all knew he had it in him. He's not, it's not that he's never led a movie before, but to lead a movie of this caliber and the size, he's never done it before, but we all had the confidence in him. He could pull it off. Robert Downey Jr. This man, I predicted in June, he'd win an Oscar. I'm still holding out on that. And, the third act of this movie, this man takes control of this film like nothing I've ever seen before. It was sensational what he did. So damn good. And, and, and Cam, you brought up how like you, you see no resemblance of Iron Man. I mean, everyone obviously connects him to Iron Man, but Downey's an incredibly talented actor and was in a lot of great movies before he even had his troubles with the law. I highly suggest going to 1992's Chaplin. Check that out. It's the best 
performance I've seen him do since Chaplin. Obviously, I love him as Iron Man, love him as Sherlock, but Downey and Chaplin is another exceptional performance of his. He got nominated for Supporting Actor. He, I think he probably should have won that year. I can't remember who he lost out to, but he is really sensational. Florence is sensational. Emily, Matt. Rami Malek. I mean, who can get Rami Malek to be in three scenes twice? He gets kind of tossed to the side of the scene, but then has an incredible speech for five minutes total in a movie. I mean, only David Christopher Nolan gets something like that. Was he like that? Amsterdam? David O. Russell in Amsterdam. David, okay, yeah, David O. Russell, yeah. But Christopher Nolan, when he calls, you answer the phone, and what he did with this film was incredible. And I've seen it twice already. I'm confident to say that I, th I, I think it's his best movie. I'm seeing it again next week, and I'll see it again the week after that because I get all my film strips that they're handing out at the 70 mil. <laughs> if you can see it in an IMAX format, try to see 70 millimeter IMAX. Try to see 70 millimeter if you can as well in just IMAX format in general. We did a two hour and 45 minute breakdown of this film last week because there's so much to talk about. It's very dense, but number one of the year, hands down. Yeah, so I'm going to be a sheep again. I'm going to say Oppenheimer is my number one of the year. Surprisingly so, I would say. Maybe not at this stage, but. I remember going into it, and, and I think it was George who said, you know, if there's a Nolan film that you'll love, it it might just be this one. And I actually read in my rankings this morning of Nolan. I think right now, as of one watch, this sits around second in his filmography. I, I think it was a, a film on an unbelievable magnitude. I think regardless of his technical aspects, which were just incredible, I think it was a technical marvel because he works with the best guys, cinematographers, the sound. Um, the bomb test sequence, we said this on our podcast yesterday, I tweeted about this after I genuinely thought I was going to die of a heart attack. It was crazy. I've never been so, my heart was just pounding like mad. It was just so intense. And I think it's, this film is a credit for not only Nolan's ability to tell stories, because that has been my slight issue with him before. I'm one of those people who, who does think his writing is, I think it's good, but I think it's weaker than his ability to produce a technical marvel. I think this showcased, like you guys said, Nolan at his best in both in both areas um, of him doing this film. I also appreciated further than that that the narrative was was so compelling in that it took you know uh, themes of morality, bureaucratic themes, and just showcasing so many different points of views. Um, the acting, as you guys said, was just incredible, and I think I also appreciate massively that Nolan. I said this on our podcast yesterday. It's very hard to make a film like this, which does have its political undertones. Western films, you know, um, a lot of the time will take political biases and directors and filmmakers will take a certain political bias and you, they'll lean a certain way. I do actually think that Nolan successfully led this film non -biased, uh, unbiased as he possibly could and didn't put his own views in there. And that might sound like a small thing to, 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 to listeners, but you'll see so many films which do lead a certain way, especially American and Western audience films. And I do think it, this rev just the whole thing resulted in just a visceral, dramatic experience that is easily one of his best films to date in my eyes. And it was just so, so impressive to see him showcase, A, why he can produce such a, a technical marvel, but also show him how he can write a really, really compelling story and do his extensive research to get it you know exactly as he needed to to produce the best to, to direct the best film about Oppenheimer as possible um literally so this is a 4.5 I haven't found a five for me yet but maybe on on, on rewatch who knows I'm still holding out for uh Napoleon being my number one most anticipated of the year but we'll see Ridley you never really know he's very hit or miss a lot of the time um but I the only literally the only issue I had is I do think there's 15 20 minutes in the final lap that kind of flows illogically and wants to find the twist, which Nolan is really good at. It's just not my favorite thing personally. And it's a little bit nonsensical, but I think this is as close to a perfect Nolan project as possibly can be. And I think this, on another watch, I think this actually could be my number one. Number one being Interstellar right now. But I think another watch, this probably could take that over. I think it, it's, um, it surprised me. I knew it'd be good, but it surprised me how well he did with this. Uh, so that is my number one of the year at a 4.5. Yeah. And, All right, Tyler. Uh, yeah, bad and clean up means uh, a lot of people have already talked to Oppenheimer, but I feel like this is just such a dense movie. I still have a lot to add that we haven't covered. So basically everything you've already said, you know, score, the production, all that, echo it completely. Um, but yeah, I'm actually going to be going to see this again later today, which for people listening means I'm going to go see it again eight days ago. So suck that. How do you like that nonlinear storytelling, Christopher Nolan? Um, <laughs> what, like you said, when, when Christopher Nolan calls – you answer in Matt Damon's case, when Christopher Nolan calls, you put your marriage in jeopardy, but that's just what the, Christopher Nolan's able to do. He's able to just go out there and get people to go do his films, no matter what um, cast members that we haven't talked about yet that I really love Josh Hartnett, 
when when the big cast of like oh, 30 God. people were, was announced, you never really knew like, okay, how much are each of these people going to get? Josh Hartnett's kind of had an up and down career in Hollywood. And he was definitely one when they released the cast of like 30 people. I was like, okay, he's going to be one of the more minor roles, but he got a huge part in this movie. And I thought he did exceptional. And then Jason Clark was ex- exceptional at making me just hate him so much. Like the main kind of interrogator uh, to Oppenheimer in those court or hearing scenes. Like he just made me so furious and he just did so well at that. And one thing that I really appreciate as I went into Oppenheimer blind in quotes in terms of I knew high level overviews from history class, but didn't dive in and research before the movie. Cause I prefer to see it blind research it a bunch after. And I'm going to go in with a, with a refresh take into it. Um, this movie is crazy realism and he stuck to the realism to a T. So like the poison apple hundred percent happened. Um, him not being a good in labs, more of a theoretical guy. Absolutely true. The whole Einstein qualms true. Um, the conversation with president Truman sounded so comedic and bizarre but that's literally verbatim like president truman literally like laughed him out of the room being like suck it up like you're not this isn't your problem like i I was just fascinated researching this after the fact of how much nolan pulled straight from history and i really appreciate that um my favorite intro and favorite ending to a nolan movie ever this has like a different layer to me because i'm an engineer and like engineers in america get swooped up like crazy by defense contractors so i've been in interviews with companies like Lockheed Martin, who have literally asked me in interviews when I was in college and said, do you have any moral issues with intercontinental ballistic missiles? And it's just like when you're a 20 year old in college looking for a job to get money, how do you even answer that? Like, how do you even answer a question of that magnitude? It's just a kid in this world. And it's just crazy, like with that perspective of what the defense industrial complex is, it's just a whole different layer to this movie. And then the last thing I'll say is just Christopher Nolan's trajectory of his last three films is easily the most interesting three film run of his career for me. And I'm super excited to see where he goes from here. We had Dunkirk, which was way different than what people expected. They were, it wasn't a bombastic war epic. It was a lot more grounded and emotional, which was really kind of a deconstruction of what we are used to from war epics. Then we had Tenet, which was really a kind of a smoke and mirrors deconstruction of what the modern action blockbuster is. Everyone's been saying for years now, not just recently with the interview, but years people have been saying they want Christopher Nolan to make a James Bond movie. That kind of was his James Bond movie. Obviously, he would like to do it with the AIP, but that was his take on what the action blockbuster has become. And of course, Oppenheimer, there's a lot of great readings you can read into of his guilt for kind of fueling the modern comic book movie phase that current cinema, cinema is leaning towards so heavily. So the last three films, I feel like are just super meta from Christopher Nolan, and I think his writing is getting stronger with each project. And this is probably the best written project for me. It's number two right now to The Prestige, but that's more so that movie just holds such a great place in my heart so it's kind of just more the emotional attachment to it but after i see it again today or eight days ago uh, it could could raise to my number one i just uh, this is a five-star movie through and through can't wait to sit through josh peck holding his finger over a button for 20 seconds and have my heart explode again (laughs) his hands shaking oh my god (laughs) prestige is a great number one to pick for nolan yeah the the dark knight is better <laughs> All right, boys. Wow, we we wrapped up our top ten rankings of 2023. We also got to do one more thing. Oh yeah, worst of the oh, year. Yeah. We're all yeah. gonna pick our worst movie of the year. Just, just right. one. Just just, just one. one. Yeah. Okay. All right, Anthony. What's your worst film of 2023 so far? Ironically, it was a movie I was excited about because it put together um, two fun genres of science fiction and dinosaurs. Uh, I yes, Adam Driver's film 65. Come on, 65. man. I, I walked into that movie like, you know what? Maybe it'll be fun. This is terrible. <laughs> I found the film to be just very boring for a movie about tailing dinosaurs with a, in a futuristic society. And I found it to be convoluted, very cliche, actually quite uninteresting, pretty unlikable characters, um, very slow in pace. Um, some of the dinosaur scenes were really cool. There was a one great moment, the reveal of the T-Rex, uh, the head behind them in the cave, flashing with the lightning and illuminating the silhouette of the t-rex's head that was my favorite moment of the moment of the film but there's a lot of just like lack of anything making sense most of the time um and i've walked out of that theater just with like a bad taste in my mouth like god damn it how do they mess that up just make adam driver killing dinosaurs it seems to like work on paper um ultimately it was just a huge disappointment even though i had modest expectations i was like that's got to be the worst one of the year so far I love that from you. I'm, I'm, I'm obviously I'm obviously one of the most vocal 65 haters on the planet, so I love that from you. <laughs> but I will say shout out Ariana Greenblatt, who plays the person who's kind of stranded with Adam Driver in this, who's also the main daughter Barbie. from Barbie. So, like, she's crazy 2023 for her at 15 years old. So, like, 
I hated 65. She's great. Yeah, she's great. She, yeah, great yeah. for her. I mean, she didn't really have much to do with 65. Script. They literally didn't even give her a, a real language to speak the whole time. So it's kind of yeah. hard to work with that. <laughs> oh, man. All right, Kim, what's your worst of the year? My lowest of the year is the incredible Ghosted starring Chris Evans and Ariana. <laughs> you actually or, watched it? Watched oh, my God. Grande. Uh, Ana de Armas, uh, not Ariana Grande. Uh, <laughs> oh, canceled. Why am I canceled? Getting them yeah. confused. Oh, God. I don't know. Uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, bad movie, ass movie. Uh, just fake, fake. It, gotta be money laundering. Just get, get a bunch <laughs> of friends. This is like just as bad as like uh, Adam Sandler making a movie company so his friends can go take a vacation for five days and pump out the wrong Missy or some shit like that. Um, it's just awful movie i uh, really hated it just so fucking stupid god damn it uh i love ana de armas i love chris evans it's not it's not good it's not worth watching it really isn't but it's funny to hate on uh on uh tiktok because a lot of people apparently enjoyed that movie so who knows i watched the uh stair chase uh race in uh Staircase chase, and I, I was like, I'm not watching this movie. Yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 it's it's impressive yeah, yeah. to try to make Chris Evans unathletic or like have <laughs> asthma. Like he's a, just, he's ripped. And it's like what? It's, <laughs> it's kind of like it's it's exactly like in Barbie when they're like when Helen Mirren's voiceover is like, note to producers, don't make Margot Robbie deliver these lines or whatever. But in in Ghosted, they like genuinely try, and they're not even like aware that Chris Evans is like the literally the sexiest man of, alive last year and just jacked out of his mind and they're like they're like he can't run he's just <laughs> incapable of running yeah funny 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 bad movie really bad good pick george you're up yeah my lowest rated uh still remains to be skin um for me just so much nothing um just a lot of walls and furniture and whispering that i just didn't fucking care about um i i respect like the experimental nature of this film and i think it's super cool that this movie had as low a budget as it did and and it it still brought people to the theaters to watch it um i i think that's a good direction for the horror genre but unfortunately it just did not land for me um i i really just did not have a good time with it a lot of people said uh to to watch it alone at home in the dark and maybe that'll amplify your experience so even though it's my lowest rate of the year i do want to re-watch it um my theater was laughing the entire time so i think that hindered my experience but in their defense i was laughing too a good amount uh i walked out of this being like damn that was one of the better comedies of the year uh so yeah skin of a rink my my lowest rated uh i'm sorry there are a lot of defenders of that movie I've seen, and I've talked to people. They're like, "Oh, I, give it a chance." I'm like, uh, "I don't know." Yeah, have, you, they, have you guys not seen it? I have not seen no. it. No. Oh, okay. Yeah, there, there's a ton of defenders of that movie. Um, I I am not one of them. Got it. All right. <laughs> My worst of the year was a colossal waste of money. Renfield, oh, insane uh, budget. Good one. And I mean, I love Nick Cage, and I was excited to see him play Dracula. And he looks like he had a lot of fun. So. That's maybe the only thing that kind of worked for me. But this movie, the script was so atrocious. It was just not fun. It was not scary. It was also, you're really seeing a Dracula movie in April. It made no sense, but I think we understand why. And none of it worked at any level. It just the aesthetic was off. There's just green light everywhere. We're like in a AA meeting and there's just green light everywhere. I just made no sense at all aesthetically tonally the writing the acting it just was not a very good movie at all and i was waiting for it to end and i love nick cage to death and i love nick cage's movies he introduced the movie too so i was so excited about it. my expectations were medium i'm gonna shut my brain off have some fun and i couldn't even have fun with my brain shut off that's how bad it is so renfield zero stars honestly it was a weird movie it felt like an ncis episode half it, the time. yeah it felt oh, like i was watching that was so TV. odd what i thought odd i was watching movie. nypd blue yeah it was so what a weird movie <laughs> i hated aquafina in that as well her character was like what is going red. on the storyline with her sister so and i was like bad. what is happening and then the yeah. third act of that movie with the gangsters 
Oh. I was like, what is this? I was like, what is this? How did, how did this get greenlit? I feel bad for Nichols Holt, too, because he's lost it on so many big roles like Batman, Superman, probably yeah, Bond uh, here and there. He was going to be then, Gabriel in yeah. Mission Impossible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He was going to be the Mission Impossible villain, but he had to do the great, and then he did this. And it's like, he is so wasted in this because he's such a talented guy. And the character of Renfield in this, terrible, terrible character. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. Great pick. Great pick. <laughs> uh, so my, my lowest, I imagine at least the real talk guys will probably think it's a certain MCU film, which I absolutely hated. <laughs> However, that provided some funny memes with the round potato looking whatever. <laughs> so I'm not going to pick that because there was fun to be had because of how bad it was. I'm actually going to go for uh, Flaming Hot, Flaming Hot Cheetos, whatever. Um, no Flaming Hot Slander. Come on. No Flaming Did you hot like slander. it? Oh, no. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we, just, uh, we respect Flaming Hot. <laughs> yeah, it was like, I just think it's absolute nonsense. It's literally a made up rags to riches story to sell a false American dream. I think, regardless of its inspiring story, it's literally an advertisement and I hated it. And I think, like, when it comes to the worst of the year, there's a few low rated ones I have, like Ant Man and Quasimania, for example. But I, I laugh at that. I actively hated Flaming Heart because I think I, I disagree with everything it stands for. I think it's an ego-boosting advertisement for the executives of the company. And I just think it was absolutely pointless and terrible. I also think the film itself wasn't good either. I don't think the film was necessarily the worst of the year, but I just hate what it stands for. But I think the film itself was also just full of racial stereotypes and stuff like that. It was so cringe. And um, yeah, just, just not for me at all. I think I have like a one. It's not like a half star. I did have a one. Um, Love that. Mania. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but definitely, definitely, definitely the worst of the year for me. I know people that liked it. I, I think it actually has like over a three on Letterboxd. I believe so, yeah. Maybe maybe it's more down to people. Because if it was a true story, I'd look at it in a different way, in a different light, I guess. But for me, just knowing the story, I just think it's just nonsense. And I, uh, I just disagree with the film. Don't like it yeah, at all. When I found out that it wasn't a true story, I decided like I didn't want to watch them. Like, then what's this? What are we doing here? If it's not really based on actual it, facts, to or maybe some some like, like, yeah, yeah. You can work for that company and you can make it from the small guy, which apparently he did. To be fair, I think he, the main actor worked as like a, a janitor and then worked his way up to like a marketing exec or something like that. Just mm -hmm. make a film on that. Just yeah, make a yeah. film on that. We don't need a film about how we invented something that's not true. And I think that's where the authenticity goes down. That's why I disagree with the film. Because it could have been done. That, that guy is still, like, he still stands by that he made it. Like, the, yeah. the actual guy, he's still, like. And it's been disproven, on. like. A yeah. Million yeah. Wow, he, really? He still wow. believes it, yeah, and tells Great. people he made it. So, to him, it's a true story. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tyler, wrap us off with your worst of 2023 so far. This has been fun because we all had different ones. Like, it is fun that we all have fresh worst of the years. And for me, it is Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. So, <laughs> I, can't believe you watched that. I still can't believe <laughs> you, you watched, watched that. that. You said we all did said you see that in a theater? You sat no, you go to the theater I did not that? go to the theater for that. Thankfully, I, it clocks in at a 0 0.2 out of 10 on the year for me. <laughs> half star review. The only reason it's not a 0 0.1 is two reasons. I, I saved 0 0.1, which is the lowest of low. I don't go zeros for like repulsive movies. I think just should not be made. This movie for the first 15 minutes had me intrigued to think this might be like so bad. It's good territory that a lot of horrors can fall into. But immediately that that rugs pulled out from under you and it's just so bad. It's bad. And it's just nothing here to latch on to. I don't know what I would do if I like was given the IP to Winnie the Pooh because it got freed up. So people were allowed to make movies. I wouldn't do this. I would do anything but this. And this is the the worst of the year, which I'm thankful for because before that it was Fool's Paradise. And I love Charlie Day. I just hated that movie. So I'm thankful like Charlie Day, you don't have to be in last anymore. So thank you to Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey for saving my boy Charlie Day. And Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey was the... When that got announced, it like started the trend of all these childhood stories being turned into horror. There's so many of them coming out now, and they're all going to be terrible. I, 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 I'm not watching that film. <laughs> yeah, there's a bunch we said we'd watch it as well. I, not honest, watch it. Like, honestly, someone rating a movie as low as a point two out of ten makes me want to watch it even more. Cause, <laughs> yeah, cause now, now I'm just curious. Now, I, just I don't want to like... put myself through that. That's the thing. Like a lot of these movies, like I only have 28 watches of 2023 movies because I'll see a trailer and I'll be like, I don't want to watch that. So then I'll watch like a great movie from the past. We see a lot of old or, movies or in international. We, we go to the yeah. new Bev a lot. Yeah, so the we... new Beverly Cinema, Tarantino Cinema in Hollywood. They play only old movies. 
and they project on film only. So we actually we've been going there almost weekly for the past several months. So we actually been watching like a lot of classic films in the cinema, which is so much fun. And something like Tron Legacy. But yeah. I mean, the public domain's lifting on so many pieces of literature in the past that people are just like, fuck it, let's make a crazy movie about Winnie the Pooh. Mm. Stupid. Nonsense. Mm. Mm. All right, that wraps Raiders of the Real Talk podcast. <laughs> that was fun. Boys, thank you so much for joining us for the crossover. It was such a blast. The people have been dying for it. It was so fun to talk with y'all on a podcast outside of social media and stuff like that. And again, you guys can find our listeners, Raiders Lost Podcast listeners, find Real Talk Podcasts on all audio platforms as well as YouTube. You guys post weekly, a couple times a week, right? Yeah, a few times a week. Yep. A few times a week. And then Real Talk listeners, you can find us, Raiders of the Lost Podcast, everywhere. Very easy to find on platforms as well as Raiders of the Lost Podcast.com. Thanks so much for tuning in. I think we should do this at the end of the year with our final top 10. Yeah, yeah let's yeah, do yeah. it. Yeah. Very cool. And again, this is. Posting on both podcasts at the same time, same day, July 31st. Box office projection is going to be about a billion dollars, so hopefully we hit it. <laughs> It'll be more than The Flash. <laughs> Definitely check out both podcasts if you're a listener of one or the other. We'd love to share the audience and make everyone aware of both of these shows. And It was such a treat to ch- talk to you fellas in a movie capacity and do an episode. It was so much fun. Got anything else to say to the listeners out there? No. Definitely yeah. do it again. <laughs> End of the year. A ton of fun. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Absolutely. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful day and enjoy the movies. Thank you so much for watching our crossover episode with the Raiders boys. That was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed hearing all of our top tens of the year as well as our least favorite of the year. If you enjoyed this episode, this crossover episode, please hit that like button on YouTube. Leave us a comment letting us know you really liked it. We definitely are open to doing more crossovers, not only with the Raiders boys, but with other guests in the future. So definitely go ahead and let us know what else you'd like to see. And if you like the, this idea of keeping it fresh with new kinds of episodes. So with that, this week's real quick episode is going to be speed racer. So make sure you go out and watch speed racer to get ready for the real quick episodes. It's going to be coming on Friday. And we just want to give a shout out to our executive producers for this episode. Seven mod, Jeffy, Adam H 16, Al Bodie, Alexander Biscardi, Ben Leggy, Ben Hansey, Brody Young, Cody Whitney, Dakota Buckner, Dean Cotamanidis, Dylan Chip. Fernando Four, Isaiah Villa, Jimmy O'Connor, Jordan Gag, Josh Hines, Luke Deerhog, Mac Wells, Marcellus, Oscar Trinick, Reese David, Relapse, Remy Walker, Roca 1.0, Sean Morales, Stefan Johnson, Trey Artsy, Will Kim, Jonas BBX, and Zach Graves. Shout out to all of you. Check out our Patreon in the description down below. Again, go over to the Raiders boys. Uh, social medias and follow them and support them and if you're new here we'd love to keep you around for new episodes because coming out on thursday we'll be doing a ranking of our top five movie scenes that made us feel a way we will never forget thank you all for watching and we will see you in the next one